the thing I found very useful for design practice uh, was to um, give myself very limited time. Because one, one thing I found with digital design tools, it's very easy to do, to use control Z, undo. And there's this idea, I'm gonna make something perfect. But making a single thing perfect is the enemy of actually getting good at stuff. Hi, welcome to the Daiku Podcast. I'm Gary Snow, and with me is the incredible Luca Reyes, who is the uh, designer of so many amazing games. Uh, probably top of mind is Ultraviolet Grassland. So, Luca, welcome. Yes, hey, thank you. Uh, thank you, Gary. Nice to be here. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't think of myself as incredible. I just try to get stuff done, but it's it's nice to be here. Well, I, I think uh, a lot of people have been, in my, been admiring your work for quite some time, including myself. And uh, you seem to have uh, quite a devoted following. And I think it's just incredible uh, how you've been able to combine your artwork and your writing and your theories and concepts all in one. But I don't want to get into that quite yet. So first of all, I want to ask you, how did you get into uh, role-playing games in the first place? What, what's, what's been your journey to get here? Uh, so it started in, uh, in elementary school, seventh grade. Um, I went to elementary school in Africa, so it was an international school, kids from all over the place. And one kid had Dungeons and Dragons, second edition and first edition, sort of jumbled together. And, uh, there, and I made a, a draconian. And I was like, oh, cool, I'm going to play this guy with, with like a sword and wings is you know fly and he's going to be called i think it was called bane because i just learned the word and it was like this is so cool and and then the, the dungeon master completely nerfed my character because like no this would be overpowered and can't fly and so on and but you know that it, it started that way um and and then try uh got to experience some rifts and so on but then after moving back uh, back to europe uh went to a small town there was um, no role-playing games there so <laughs> uh it became the kind of the kind of thing of like uh, i'd get a game now and again then eventually when amazon came it was amazing we could get i could get books i could uh, show my friends actual books this is what we can play see and now it's new and improved it's third edition this is going to be great and if you remember third edition at a certain point the numbers get very big and the combat gets very slow but uh, <laughs> that was the start. And did you have a, a favorite that you kind of always lean towards, or, did, or did, was it primarily you mentioned riffs, uh, Dungeons and Dragons? Did you like start to explore other genres? I did to to an extent, but a lot of that uh, I had to um, improvise by myself, essentially making up games, making up rules, just because the books weren't available. Um, like, like I said, I think Amazon came on the scene in '99. Something like that. That's when when I managed to order books. I, I think at that point I also got to try out uh, Alternity, which came from TSR, the, the sci-fi game, and like I liked the ideas of it a lot, but uh, the practical execution was a little bit clunky. But yeah, so so try got to try different things. But most of the time we played um, things that we called D and D, but obviously it was a lot of house rules together. And so when, at what point did you finally go, hey, I've been making my own rules and I, I think I might want to take a shot at either designing adventures or uh, mm -hmm. making my own game? Uh, so the first time I did, I think must have been around 2008, 2009, I was playing fourth edition and uh, at a, like uh, we were playing a long running campaign at a certain point, it just got so slow. It was just um, didn't work at all. So, uh, so I made a version hack off of it uh, using the micro light, mixing that. And I was like, this is actually pretty cool. And we played it and like all the players enjoyed it. And I said, this is pretty cool. So I shared it. Uh, so, so I went to look where I could share it. So I found the forge. I shared it. And I was told, this is just Dungeons and Dragons. Go away here. We, we do <laughs> creative games. And I tried to share it on um, Dragon's Foot Forum, and I got told to go away. We we only do Dungeons and Dragons. You don't have levels. This is not Dungeons and Dragons. So it was like this sort of situation where we're like, well, okay. Um, 
uh, and uh, it it was actually G plus, which I found I think in like two thousand. Well, when when everybody who had a blog or anything on Google was pushed onto G plus, and by coincidence I found the OSR and G plus. It must have been like two thousand eleven, two thousand twelve, around there that I first got an inkling of it, and I'd been uh, drawing maps, uh, so sharing them on like the Cartographers Guild, this website, and some on Deviant Art, and then one of them got picked up, and then uh, the first step was really uh, with Chris Kutalik of um, Hill Cantons, who brought me on uh, to illustrate the Misty Isles of the Elves. And that was sort of the first step. And then going from there, I think it must have been like uh, 2015, 2016, thereabouts. Uh, I'd been doing the art, I'd been, you know, writing small things here and there. And, um, and then I started a Patreon. And I didn't know exactly what I was going to do that it was just this interesting thing and uh, I was I was a bit uh, at, at a loose end uh, uh, wrapping up things in Switzerland before moving uh, to Korea started that thing I, and I was wondering like okay what should I should I maybe do like uh, like uh, I'll just make illustrations uh, with characters and then people are going to vote on where it goes next and that was not really fun for me um, but uh, I, I sort of iterate and try things out. And eventually came in this thing like, okay, I've, I've had for a long time this idea. I had this uh, home setting that I ran with uh, the Rainbow Land. And then there is this uh, wild place off to the West, into the utter West, the ultraviolet grasslands, where I don't actually know what's there yet. Um, you don't know what's there yet. How about we turn it into this trip? Like I write out like what's there and I illustrate it. And, and we just go on, on, on to a trip. And the, the people on the patron at that time, it was like, I think 20 people or something uh, were like, yeah, this sounds fun. Um, so I started doing that. <laughs> and uh, and uh, that took about two years to, to write and draw. And people liked it. And it got bigger. And uh, I finished it more or less must have been uh, 2018 in the summer of 2018 and then after that i decided okay i need something shorter and then i wrote Witchburner in one month um so uh so yeah that was sort of the journey <laughs> well and th so throughout that i mean your art s plays so heavily in all of your games have you always drawn as a like from a young child yeah. onwards? Since, since I was like uh, since I was a kid, since I was like three years old, my my mom started out teaching me how to draw. Uh, I drew like my first comic book when I was like five years old or something. So it was like I basically took a notebook, you know, like one of those thirty-two page notebooks you'll give a kid, and I just drew a comic book and the whole thing. And uh, that that comic book, uh, I I really liked the character of Snoopy. So then I copied another comic book that I knew. So I gave Snoopy two other dog friends uh, and gave them like, an, like three friends going on an adventure kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I always drew. Uh, I actually wanted to go um, study architecture, but my dad was strongly against that. So uh, I didn't because, uh, because I was told there are too many architects. If you go study architecture, you will never get a job. So you have to go study something more useful. And if you try to go study architecture, you're on your own and I'm not financially supporting you. And, you know, at that age, I was just like, <laughs> so I didn't go study architecture. Um, and, and then from there, it was like a, a really long journey to, kind of, to come to sort of a, a feeling that, okay, even if I didn't study art, even if I didn't study design, like at the university level, I can still make this stuff because I had like a, a very strong, um, should we say mental block against doing it? I felt uh, very insecure about it for a really long time. And I find it interesting. And you were like talking about architecture, and I mean your design and layout like has that elements to it. I you you really mm -hmm. play with like actual like buildings and space and and layout, and it's kind of like a natural instinct, I would say, for you at this point. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, it's something I always enjoyed. So I guess it's like, a, you know, like roundabout journey and then you come back to, to where you started in some ways. Although I have to say, making games is more fun than I think architecture would be. So it's sort of a, you know, win-win. And, yeah, and buildings don't crumble unless you like roll a one or something like that. Right? So. <laughs> 
or, or don't do maintenance on a bridge or something. Yeah. yeah. But uh, you, your work has been compared to uh, Mobius quite a bit. Um, obviously, that seems to be a bit of an influence. I've got uh, yeah some heavy metal magazines here, and uh, yeah, it, and it, it it was a pretty big influence. Yeah, when when I came across it in my late teens and like early twenties, I, I liked it a lot. And uh, like especially with Mobius's work, I, I find it really beautiful because of this. Um, incredible lightness of, of line and color that, that he brings, uh, brought to his work. Uh, like seeing, uh, seeing Mobius draw is just uh, astonishing. Like if you ever see a video of how he, uh, how he creates <laughs> the scenes, the things, it's, it's astonishing. I'm nowhere near as good. Um, but yeah, that, that was uh, an inspiration. And then uh, another uh, artist that I like quite a lot is uh, Hugo Pratt, no, or is it Hugo Pratt? I'm not sure, uh, who did the, the Corto Maltese. Um, it's, it's a much um, sketchier style, but uh, he captures so much uh, nuance and emotion. It's just, uh, just really fascinating. And I think I asked you before the interview about uh, Herge, I think that's the way you pronounce it, with Tintin. Yes, Tintin. I yes. just like, I, we'll show Long Winter later on, but I just like, I couldn't help but see some... <laughs> Similarity. Yeah, long winter especially. Yeah, like that. That one is is um, quite explicitly like I, a lot of it is drawn with a sort of uh, uh, lean clair style with uh, uh, very simple lines and not uh, not very uh, not a lot of changes in line weight. So it's it's definitely an influence. Like when I, when I was a kid, uh, Tintin and Asterix were uh, two of my favorite comics. I still have them although not here because books are heavy so they, they've stayed back uh, back home in slovenia uh but yeah yeah those are definitely an influence um then a lot of uh, the science fiction that i read was an influence uh, for for me many times i, I found uh, especially the sort of um socially and politically themed science fiction very interesting because it asks very interesting questions of what if what would happen if things were different in a certain way and I found it more interesting than straight up fantasy because a lot of fantasy just took the um, the the skin of uh, uh, Lord of the Rings, for example. It's like, oh, it happens um, in a mystical long ago, and there are gods, and uh, the people are doing things because they are doing things, and it uh, doesn't feel so very imaginative. Uh, even if it's uh, many times fantasy, even if it changes things around, it's just uh, changes the skin a little bit. Let's say instead of being set in fantasy Western Europe, it's now going to be set in fantasy Northern Europe or fantasy Southern Europe or fantasy Rome or fantasy China or fantasy al Qadim. <laughs> Sorry, not al Qadim, but you know what I mean. It's like, yeah. um, uh, whereas with, uh, with science fiction, there was um, with authors like uh, Stanislav Lem, or uh, the Strugatsky brothers uh, from uh, Roadside Picnic, or uh, Kurt Vonnegut, or um, what's his name, Philip K. Dick. Philip K. Dick, yeah. massive influence. Uh, there's this just sense of like, the author just goes somewhere very strange and gives me ideas that I didn't have before. Um, and I, I, th I think that's also something that I very much want to bring into my work, this idea that some things can become just very unusual, very unusual, very different. And uh, you mentioned uh, roadside picnic, and that the mood of that, um, just yeah. like it seems to that one in particular. When I saw that as a reference, and just knowing a little bit about that book, it just it does really convey into especially ultraviolet grasslands and a lot of your um, settings. In fact, that just the mood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I like that, that mood, that idea there's uh, just, you know, something big and strange and unknowable. It's not necessarily hostile. It's just very strange. And, and then how, um, in, in, in the context of a story, how, how the story would flow around it. It's like uh, if, if a story, like, like if you take like, the, the way people think about like, story beats, you know, you, you just have like the flow of a river. Uh, and the wonderful thing with role-playing games is that it's an art form um, close to theater and improv. It's it's like a, it's like a kind of game uh, game and drama, um, and it's really wonderful because you have this flow, the story beats, and then you put a big dumb object in the middle. What's going to happen? And like the players don't know, but also um, 
the game master, the referee, or in UVG, the top cat, doesn't know. Nobody knows. It's like, here's the river. Here's the, uh, the big dumb object. What happens? Let's find out. And, and that's always so uh, exciting for me because it's like you, you place the situation. And, and this is something that I also love about the OSR because it doesn't assume that there's a plot that goes from point A to point Z. It's like, there's a plot that goes like A, B, C, whoa, something. Figure out what happens next. Um, and with Roadside Picnic, there's this anomaly that is never explained. Um, the, the idea that sort of comes to mind, it's like, uh, oh, all powerful aliens just stopped by to, to, have, um, to do something and left behind some things. And this is what we are do dealing with. So it sort of makes the analogy, what if we humans are like ants that come across the leftovers of a picnic that a group of people had by the roadside? Um, and it's just so fascinating because it's like, yes, it becomes just completely alien. And then taking those things, appropriating them in some way, changing them into another thing. Yeah. And I'm going to share my screen now. And uh, even though I, it's funny, I actually thought Witchburner was before Ultraviolet Grasslands. So my mistake. Uh, it was published before. No, no, no. It was published before uh, because uh, the, um, the version of UVG was finished like a month before. And then I needed a break, something shorter. So, um, so Witchburner is actually closer to a lot of the older games I ran before, like in the late 90s, early 2000s. And it's based um, also on, uh, on the area I come from in, in Slovenia. So uh, the vicinity of, uh, of Tolmin in, in the Julian Alps. So that informs a lot of... Um, the themes that are present, the idea of this, uh, a war happened previously and the consequences are still here. There's this uneasy peace going on, there are tensions at the same time within the town. Uh, everybody knows one another, but there are also tensions there. Uh, like anybody who, who comes from that region will probably like recognize that I lifted the map, <laughs> partly. Oh, well, where is um, it from? Uh, it's uh, it's actually um, the, the town of Bridge is uh, based on uh, on a town called uh, Most Sochi, which means the bridge on the river Socha, which used to be in Italian called Santa Lucia, and Lucia means uh, clear, lucid, hence Saint Clear Eyes. <laughs> so so it's all there, and it's uh, it's actually a, a small town that's been settled since at least uh, the Bronze Age because it's this sort of natural confluence between several rivers and several valley systems and so yeah so, this is the, the the burner edition the free one the burner edition and so one of the things that like when i first got into the osr and i i saw your uh your game here and i saw it through 10 foot pole and um bryce's blog about where he rates uh, adventures and I couldn't help but be intrigued by some of the comments that came in and, and through the review. And, and one of them was, and I don't want to spoil it for anybody. So anybody <laughs> listening. Yeah, cover your ears. Cover your ears for 30 seconds. But the fact that uh, there was no witch to burn seemed to be yeah. a real uh, talking point or like a problem yes. for some people. Yeah, yeah, it annoyed some people a lot, yeah. Even though I actually in, in the game put in the option, like if you think this will be a problem with your players, here's how to put in an actual witch. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the, the adventure is, yeah, it's, a, it's a sort of a, a social adventure. It's a social study of, uh, of a town that is being beset by troubles and, um, and is stressed and is looking for a way out. Um, so yeah, in, in the full version, the, you know the calamities are all there this is like the <laughs> the, the free preview uh, uh so so yeah it, it analyzes like what will happen and um in, in a way to anybody who knows you know some star trek they, they might get a sense of like the kobayashi maru the way to yeah. win is not to play um like uh it's uh, it's uh, it's also a little bit of a, a morality play or a morality game where uh, the players the player's characters are led along this path where to do the thing that is morally very questionable is actually quite easy. It's even rewarded in some ways. Um, and so it uh, places this challenge. It's like, 
your characters, if they do the good thing, they will pass up an, uh, an easy win, quote unquote. Um, and I, I think that's a very interesting question to pose to people. But obviously, if, if you're running a role playing game, just you know, to have a bit of fun and uh, <laughs> kill some uh, goblin elves running around an abandoned sky forest, uh, th this is not for you. Um, and I tried to make that clear, but I guess one of the lessons is <laughs> for some of the things, um, for some of the products, it, it would really help to just like make a very clear disclaimer maybe hidden by spoiler tags that people can just check. Will this work for you or not? Well, I think now that people kind of know your style, they know what they're kind of getting in for uh, or getting into. I would be surprised. Well, fortunately, new people still come and find it. And unfortunately, some of them still get unpleasantly surprised. So. Uh... <laughs> and the calamities, how much fun did you have uh, coming up with all those calamities? Ah. Uh, or was it hard a lot. after a while? No, 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 it wasn't hard. It, it was quite a lot. Like a lot of them are, are actually based on um, half remembered because at, at one point I read long before I actually wrote this adventure, I, I wrote quite a bit about uh, the witch trials in Europe and uh, the mass hysteria that came about. And so I half remembered some of the things witches were, were accused of, uh, of causing. And um, and it was fun getting to use and getting them to adapt to this uh, this environment. It's uh, it's always fun making making like a nice table with with options is always fun. Yeah, um, and so this was as you mentioned before uh, Witchburner came out, and and you talked yeah. about uh, you know the the lands to the west and the adventure calling, and who knows yeah. what's going to be there. How did the name come up and like? the creation um, story of your game yeah so it actually came about so, uh, the setting we uh, we created together with my group at the time uh with my role-playing group in in lausanne uh switzerland and they were from all over the place uh from um southern europe eastern europe northern europe the states um and well not the states but canada specifically uh so so one of the the initial players was canadian so uh um and they called themselves the golden goats and we created the rainbow lands and they weren't called the rainbow lands when we started creating them it was uh, it started out with like me drawing a big circle in the middle of the page and saying like this is the sea uh there is a thing in the middle um it's, it's basically, it's a space elevator. I, I don't explicitly say it in the book, but hey, oh, sorry, spoilers. <laughs> spoiler tag. It's a space elevator. It's an abandoned space elevator in the middle. Um, and there are mountains to the north and mountains to the south because, you know, we, we have like a roughly landscape oriented paper. So it's like, this is just why it's not going to spread there. And let's fill it in. And um, one of the players called one of the lands, I think uh, was... Uh, the red land and then another player said like well this is then the green land and then that's how it became they just filled it out with with those colors so uh, well we filled it out playing together um because the way i usually run these collaborative sessions is that even though i might be uh, the referee in that case i just sort of take on a role of a, a player and um kind of uh game host or moderator so i move things along or when somebody gets stuck i give some suggestions and then i, I use this thing i call a soft veto where if something feels like it might make somebody uncomfortable or is going a little bit out there i sort of like pause things and suggest could we tweak this or is everybody okay with it um and uh and then eventually we had like all these things and uh, um and then i don't even remember who it was somebody came up with this idea well here are the violet lands. So, you know, over there, that's, um, so I think I, I, uh, I think I came up with the idea over here in the utter west is the black city. And somebody was like, oh yes. And between the black city and the violet lands are the ultraviolet grasslands um, before it all fades to black. And that's how it actually started. Well, I mean, it's such a fantastic environment and just combining so many different elements, like it's got that kind of Western, uh, desolation traveling through the desert Oregon trail 
type of thing and well as just like really high concept kind of science fiction as far as the moral play as we've already kind of discussed a little bit and yeah. when when people talk to you about it kind of what what surprises you the most out of like some of their reactions um the, the really interesting thing is when when people play it through and the very very different stories they come up with uh that that's always lovely and when when uh, when some people tell me how they've played like 40 60 sessions getting all the way to the black city and then you know what their black city was and what how they used it to i don't know reset reality or whatever i just find it uh, completely brilliant because um they've essentially uh taken the seeds that i've sort of put out there in um in uh, the uvg in the book and then grown them into completely different things that i couldn't have expected uh when when i started writing or even when i finished it and uh, that that's always something something really amazing i i find it uh, personally really exciting to see this it was not something i expected uh i mean i hoped something like this would happen uh, there there was the idea like like the map of the uvg is designed explicitly in the hope that a group will print it out and then draw on it right that's why it's like really long and it's like the hope is like print it out and then stick it together and every time you have a session you bring out the map and you're drawing on it and creating your own experience of this world that was also the reason that i didn't actually put the the various um sub locations uh, so called the discoveries uh, on the map itself because i wanted players to put them there like if they discover a thing it goes on the map if they don't discover it it's not there um and so that in the end uh, the result of playing a, a role playing game is like you have a physical artifact that the table has produced together because i for me that's one of the um, uh like the individual session of a role playing game for me is really fun like like i said it's it's a different kind of art form like like drama or something like that but uh, but there is also something special to campaign play when you stay with a uh, play with a group of friends or become a group of friends over an extended period of time playing together and there's just something beautiful in having an artifact together and uh i i was one of those like uh, always uh, the eternal gm uh, in our group basically <laughs> and uh, i like it but at the same time i didn't like being the only one taking the notes and i also felt like there was something missing when um when uh, that sort of game of uh preparing and creating a world uh wasn't something that all the other players could also share into so i guess that's one of the themes that sort of has started to come out in 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 my works where i try to create things that uh, at the end of a session or at the end of a campaign the the player group the table has something that they can share and, and look at because for me with groups i've played with there are very many fond memories and with some of my friends some of our best memories are um not necessarily things we did uh, in the real world but the stories we ended up inventing and playing through in role playing games and especially not the stories we made up but um the responses to the things that happened you know like the dice the role came through and then what follows from that like like there's one just completely amazing story um uh where the players okay it start it started so i i was already at that point giving players a lot of freedom in how to describe their characters how to build their motivation and so on. so one of the players started out as a necromancer and i already had like this corruption table that if you have like some dark magics the player can be corrupted and so on. so he started out started the game uh, and i was starting him at sort of third level so they're a bit strong started the game as a necromancer without a face like his face had gone off he was basically skeletor uh the other two players were like oh can we be his henchmen like uh, on on missions for him and the guy had like this whole motivation that his necromancer was in love with a sea nymph but she wouldn't even give him the time of day because he had no face so he wanted a face um so i was like okay uh uh the blood of a red dragon will uh, restore your face and and then all these shenanigans like followed it was it was completely mad and then at one point uh the this group of adventurers um uh power gamers by the standards of uh, most old school gamers complete power gamers uh they're they're on a boat and um 
a Leviathan, a great sea monster rises up to swallow their boat. And one of the players was playing, had rolled up this character that it's uh, like, uh, like his trait was he was a golden boy blessed by the gods because he like rolled the highest results. So he just got on across the board, but bonus all his stats and he basically could never get dirty. Like his locks were always shining like perfect gear. And the character and the player was a bit bored with the character. So he's like, I jump into the sea monster's throat and try to kill it from the inside. And I'm like, okay, you, you do realize it. <laughs> you're most likely going to die. Like the odds, this is just going to be terrible. He's like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm, I'm fine. I'm, I'm doing this. So he jumps in and I, I was playing like with um, the exploding criticals and everything because I just found it fun. Like, uh, like that's something I, I took from, from a home rule from when we were playing third edition. And if you remember in third edition D&D, the military pick has a times four damage multiplier. And, and it was beautiful because once in one session, a player using a military pick dealt 512 damage to a beholder in a single blow. And it was, it was so epic. It was like the best thing ever. Like, like the boss for the end of the dungeon, nothing, nothing matched that moment. And so, so I, I wanted more of that. So I kept that. And so he dives in and then he rolls an actual 20. And then he rolls again, confirms it a second natural 20. And like while being swallowed, this golden boy throws his bastard sword through the Leviathan's heart, killing him <laughs> in a one <laughs> shot, basically. And it was amazing. Like it, it yeah. was really, really brilliant. It, it was like the perfect sea monster battle. Um, where did I start with this? Oh, right. Uh, and this story is something that like with, with this friend and with the other uh, friends who were there playing at the time, this has remained like something that we remember fondly, like, like something that happened. And it didn't happen because we narrated that this would happen. It was the dice. It was like a one in 400 chance of this happening. It happened. It happened to happen at a very cool moment. And now all of us remember this. This is like um, a point, a memory in our lives from, I'm guessing, 15 years ago now. <laughs> so, yeah. And it's brilliant. And I think that's one of the, the beautiful things about the OSR or the OSR style of play is you get those moments that you normally might not get through a more structured, like, okay, this is point A, B, yeah. C, D, and okay, you've completed the task and, and it's functional and a lot of people have fun with it, but you, you don't get that magic that can come. I mean, there's always fun parts of it, but the mad, that those yeah, special yeah. one in 400 times yeah, like, yeah those are rare when the rng gods smile on you <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you also wrote an article in your blog recently uh, uh penguins don't play as written and that's very much on the same yeah. kind of vein and uh, so it, if you're not uh, uh uh subscribing to uh luca's patreon or his website i'm going to put all those links in uh, into the description and Thank everything you. like that. And make sure that uh, you go there. And you, I have to say, before I move on, your Patreon is very generous compared to a lot of other Patreons I've seen. Like you really go the extra mile and make sure that you share a lot of your designs and pre-works and that, that kind of thing. So I've I've always found that it's really good value and I always appreciate that. So just- Yeah, I, I try to. Uh, on the Patreon, it was actually a funny thing. It, um... It, it took some, some time to find a model that worked for me because initially I had a uh, per project um, system where every time I had a thing done, I would share it and uh, uh, collect revenues for that um, because I was very stressed out about like, oh, if, if I don't do enough or make enough, um, then um, then the, the patrons won't be uh, you know, satisfied. It's like, I, I'm sure changing them. But then psychologically, it actually became hard because then I had this pressure that I had to keep like one upping myself. And at one point, it was like one of the things that I shared for for Roderick was like, well, I think Witchburner was just like a one month's Patreon thing. So I shared it and, and it's a 60 page book, <laughs> which might be excessive. I don't know. Uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, going to uh, the penguins never play as written. Um, it's just this. Uh, I, I guess I was trying to make the observation that um, I, I'm I'm not a fan of the approach of rules as written. 
uh, where the idea is that the designer has this perfect vision of how uh, the things should work out and, and you should play exactly to the designer's plan because the designer is somebody on a pedestal who knows exactly what they're doing. Um, and uh, part of the reason I sort of uh, don't, don't like putting a designer on a pedestal is because especially when I was younger, um, reading the first edition AD&D Dungeon Master's Guide, the voice of the designer there was completely authoritative. This is Gary Gygax, and he hath come from on high with the truth of role-playing games, and thus you shall play them, or you are having fun wrong. And this um, stymied a lot of my work, but also a lot of my play for a long time. Like, like the injunction against Monty Hall games. First of all, I didn't even know what Monty Hall was. You know, like I, I, I'm a kid from Central Europe. What do I know about Monty Hall? Um, what, and Monty, like, when was Monty Hall? What, I've never seen this thing, okay? And, and there's this thing, like, do not turn your game into a Monty Hall game. Like, don't just give out your, your players uh, uh, artifacts and stuff. You have to, like, struggle for them and earn them. When, like, in my experience, one of the most fun things is you have first level characters, give them something completely overpowered and then see what happens. Yeah. Again, it's, it's like that, you know, roadside picnic. It's like yeah. just put it right here. Like what happens? Because it's always so interesting and, um, and it can blow up your, your setting in, in amazing ways. And that's also sort of fun. Um, and, and there was this, uh, and, and so, uh, so it's sort of a rebellion against this authoritative designer uh, because at the end of the day, uh, I, I find role playing is one of the things that's very interesting is um, the designer makes a thing and this, um, so let's say writes a game and this, this game is designed for two different audiences, uh, usually, um, sometimes three. So you have the person who reads this is one audience, but then uh, the people who play this are a separate audience. And sometimes the person who reads this is also translating this work for the players. And so you have these multiple steps um, and you have multiple audiences, uh, audiences to satisfy. And this means that uh, by definition, without even getting into the fact that uh, the, the people who are in the audiences are different from different backgrounds, uh, you can never satisfy all the audiences because they have um, different goals and different needs. And so you are making a, a product that tries to satisfy certain core requirements, but then there are edge cases. And if you try to capture every single edge case, you are losing um, the the wonderful thing about role playing games, which is, it's uh, it's a it's like it's an art form and drama and game and dice and played by real life people in real time. Which means that if you come across an edge case, you can just make a decision and move on. You don't have to have the solution for every single edge case because they will come up so rarely. You know, it's like flipping a coin, like. Mm -hmm. Um, if you have a, a coin flip in the game, do you need an actual rule for what happens if the coin lands on its edge? Because I think the stats are something like one in 3,000 or one in 6,000 coin flips, it lands on its edge. It's never happened to me. <laughs> so I don't know if that's true, but, you know, with those odds. Um, but do you then need, like if you're making a game that depends on a mechanic, which is flip a coin, if it lands on, on the edge, do you need a specified mechanic for what to do in that case? Or can you rely on fact that a group of players will come up with their own solution maybe they'll just say oh it's on an edge just flip it again it's the same thing like oh the die fell off the table roll again or maybe they'll decide oh it's on the edge wow something super cool has to happen and i i think it's best to leave those situations uh, to the players because they know themselves they know their group they know their group dynamics and they know what they want to do and so trying to to specify every single thing isn't great but also when you are playing trying to stick to um, the rules as written isn't working because part of what you're doing at that point is you are trying to imagine what the designer meant as the correct interpretation of their rules when it's highly likely and i can say this now as a game designer may maybe i'm a bad game designer <laughs> this is possible um it it's very possible but I but many times people come up with oh, did you mean this and this with this thing? And I'm just like, I didn't think it through that far. <laughs> I, 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 I have no opinion. <laughs> you know? 
Well, I, I guess segueing into that, your your de your design philosophies and how you actually lay out the uh, the games and how you put the mechanisms in place. Most designers, like you're pretty rare. You have to admit, you do the art, you do the layout, yeah. you do yeah. the writing, and you yeah. actually seem to really also enjoy the mechanics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, 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 it's moderately rare. Yeah. It, it, it really helps with, with making a living in like indie RPGs and indie games if you can do a lot of things by yourself because uh, it makes things go faster and brings down costs. And uh, that's like, uh, so a little bit is a force, force of necessity, uh, I guess. Well, I, I've said on previous uh, videos that like you were built to be a tabletop role playing <laughs> game designer. Like <laughs> you oh, just, I, I you hope some other things skills. too eventually. Yeah. Um, I, I uh, just wanted to share, this was, uh, you unleashed this on the world at uh, Halloween through your Patreon. Yeah, last year said. Halloween, yeah. And I, th I just thought it was like a fun, how, how long did it take you? To, and now we're kind of getting into the, like the design side yeah. of like, how you draw. Uh, and... So this one, it actually took me three years to make. But the actual me doing work on it took about two weeks. So I, figure, so I figured out the adventure I wanted to make three years ago. I was listening to a song um, and uh, it, it's like, it's listed at the end of the <laughs> module. And I was listening to the song and I was like, oh my God, that is so creepy. That is like, that is such a creepy scenario. Of course, you know, half of the lyrics, I misheard them. So <laughs> I sort of, you the, the, the actual adventure. Hmm? Yeah, you I know, you know, the, the mind runs along and fills in the blanks, exactly. And so I, I knew what I wanted it to do, but uh, I didn't have the time and I didn't have the answer for uh, how exactly to structure it. Um, because uh, par part of uh, what makes Let Us In work is that it's made with uh, pre-made characters that have a pre-existing connection to one another. And each of them has some special abilities that they can, tr can trigger in certain uh, circumstances. So yeah, spoiler alert, yeah. Um, and, and they also end up in conflict with one another. And, and then there's this uh, horror module and it's, it's basically, it's, uh, it's an escape from a haunted house. Um, and then making it, uh, the process was, um, I, I, for the last couple of years, I've been trying to focus on finishing Seacat and it's massive and it's, you know, it's, it's like, it's like the white whale in Moby Dick. It's, uh, <laughs> it's bigger than I thought it would be. Um, and, and so I put off actually writing Let Us In for a long time because I didn't want to have a distraction, but then at some point I, I needed a distraction. And Exalted Funeral came in with uh, this option, like if we can get it done in, in time. So um, what I did was I made uh, a trial layout first so I could see the, how much text I could get onto a page, how much space I would have. Um, so I could figure out, okay, we need about uh, 16 uh, pages. And uh, then once that was done, we sent the test files to the printers because I think it was printed with uh, Rizograph. Rizograph. Uh, so it's a, um, it's, it's a special printing technique, which is why the, the physical copies are so bright orange because it's printed in two colors, Pantone black and Pantone orange. And Pantone orange is really bright orange. Um, <laughs> and, um, and uh, so, so that went uh, went ahead. Uh, like Exalted Funeral was handling the, the physical production, which they've been doing for uh, basically all of my uh, English language physical books. Um, which is one thing I don't handle. I don't I don't handle the, the physical production because it's like like, like you said, uh, layout, writing, art, and so on is already a big stack of things to handle. So the physical production, shipping, distribution, I have no idea about that. It's like I don't know, um, thankfully. <laughs> it's not something I think I'd be good at. Um, and so then I went back to, to write it out from, from the notes I already had. And 
because it's only 16 pages, it was relatively short. So I got the writing done in about uh, one week. Then it went off to the editor. The edits came back. Um, I complained loudly to the editor. You're trying to cut the things that I think are important. Mm -hmm. This is, um, the editor did not respond. Um, I, I, I took the edits on board, um, set, uh, set it up in the layout and we shipped it off. And um, yeah, the, the last week was also ma making the art uh, so, so this is actually hand drawn. It's not. Uh, it's not like uh, using any kind of three D or anything. I mean, I, I used Procreate, but I, I drew it by hand. Well, that was using an my, isometric grid. That was going to be my next question: Is like your process? Is it now all digital in Procreate? Is that your tool of choice? Uh, no, no, no. Um, mostly, most of the work I still draw. Um, I could show. Them. I have them right here. I have lots of <laughs> stuff right here, um, but it's like, they start out as drawings, it's like that. And then I digitize them, which nowadays, because phones are so uh, so good, mostly it's just a phone photo and then clean up in um, Affinity Photo, which I use instead of Photoshop. Like people can use Photoshop, but Affinity Photo doesn't require a subscription, doesn't require Creative Cloud. It, there's no nagging software asking me to update, asking me to do things, um, which is why I use the Affinity Suite. Um, I've, I've had experiences with Creative Cloud updating like InDesign or Photoshop and then me not being able to open old files anymore yeah. or like losing a whole day to some update error. So uh, I prefer this. It, it, it doesn't have all the options, but it has like 90% of them, 95 and of the ones that I use, it has basically all of them. Uh, so I take it into Affinity Photo, I clean it up, and then using the cleaned up uh, file, if I'm just using it as black and white, I'll just use that. Um, otherwise, if I add color, I usually use Procreate. I sometimes experiment with other software as well. And in those cases, the, the method is usually pretty simple um, because uh, li like you mentioned with Tintin and some of the influences, I, I like um, flat colors. It's just sort of like looks looks nicer to me, and um, especially since uh, digital painting has become so widespread, I, I think there's so much of this digital Magic the Gathering style around, and it's technically very very proficient. It's very good, um, but making art like that takes a very long time. Which as a solo creator, I I don't have that much time, uh, so that's one thing. Uh, but it also ends up, uh, to my mind, all of it looking very similar. It's sort of in, in the same way that like if you look at 19th century paintings, um, like the, uh, the classical academy style, the, the realistic paintings with the classical proportions of like uh, ancient uh, Greek or Roman legends. These are beautiful paintings. They're amazing. The skill of these people, the mastery of the anatomy. Also, all of them look sort of the same. Uh, and so they don't stand out. Um, and so I, I, I try to find this compromise between um, making my art fast enough and making it also stand out. And that's why I also mostly use flat colors besides just liking them. So and then technical I mentioned, constraints. And then I mentioned you uh, actually love, it seems to me that you love rules. And let's just talk about Seacat. Uh, you said you're, you're uh, yes. a whale. <laughs> And yes, yes, CCAT. So uh, if you scroll up just to the top, um, okay, okay. so it's uh, so the, the CCAT is the name of the system and it's basically just the acronym of the six stats. And the reason I did that is because I find it humorous that uh, that is the way it works in the old Fallout games, computer games, where the system is called special. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't, uh, but, uh, but I decided to go for something a little bit more absurd. So I went for CCAT. Um, and, um, it's, uh, it's essentially the, the, the rule book expanding on, on the rules in the UVG. And uh, eventually I split it, uh, recently I split it now again into two books. So one of them is Uranium Butterflies, Heroes of the Vast Lands. And the other one that I haven't uh, published yet is uh, Synthetic Dreams Wholesale, Wholesale Vast Lands for the Heroes, which is, uh, is the one with uh, content for generating worlds and settings and locations, stuff like that. But yes, to the system, to the book.
And do you ever, have you ever thought about using somebody else's SRD or mechanics just so that you can concentrate on world building? Was that ever a consideration? I, I did. I definitely did. But, um, but then I have the system that I actually enjoy very much with, with like the exploding criticals and the wackiness and stuff like that. And it's actually a pretty minimalist system. So I thought, I'll just write it up. This is going to be an easy thing. But then it turned out that if I wanted to write it up, but also present the, uh, the options that I wanted for generating events, generating character, generating creatures, uh, it suddenly became very big. Uh, like the core system for, for CCAT, I think it takes up like 20 pages, something like that. And um, it's, it derives uh, from uh, fifth edition, uh, well, from DMV, obviously. It's, it's derived from there. But then it does some other things where um, it becomes uh, much more of a meta game system. So, for example, it's the players that earn experience, not the characters. And players can transfer experience between characters. Uh, for example, they can retire a character to recover the XP, put it into another uh, character. They can put XP into weapons or pets or sidekicks to level them up and make them more powerful. So, um, so it sort of plays with this uh, role um, of, of the player as having more, more or, or a different role, separate role from the character, from the hero. Um, and uh, the magic system is uh, essentially it started from uh, from micro life, uh, which I liked very much because it just uses life or hit points for powering magic, and it adds this element of naturally balancing spell casting. So one thing that in in a lot of classical Dungeons and Dragons style games is the wizard gets a d4 for uh, for hit points, and the fighter gets d10, and the wizard, if it ever goes up against anything that can hit it, is just going to die, and that's just a fact of life. Until at level nine, the wizard gets like the game breaking spell, and then you can just stop playing anything else. And that's that. That assumes that you can play all the way up to nine levels, and this is not something I can assume anymore. Like as I've gotten older. Um, bringing a group together to play it it's relatively hard and also i've played the lower levels many times i don't want to play the lowest level schlubs again over and over especially if i can like only get players together for three or four sessions then i want to be able to run something that's like um, a mini series and in that case i want more abilities more powers um the chance uh, to uh, to affect things more um and so in the end what CCAT is, is something, so this is a blog post I haven't published yet because the blog post is 7,000 words long and I need to trim it down because 7,000 words, nobody's going to read that. Um, what, what I call um, the CCAT system is that it's uh, ornate minimalism, uh, which means the underlying system is actually pretty minimalist. Uh, it, it has like limited modifiers. So you roll a D20 and add modifiers and the size of the modifier is capped a uh, hard cap at plus 13 you never get more than plus 13 that's it why is it plus 13 because it's 13 it's a magic number it looks nice um but also mechanically because it's just a little bit more than half the value of a d20 so if you get the maximum modifier then you have very good odds of almost always succeeding right um you have um a, a life score that is used to power abilities and spells and other stuff you have uh, very many different skills, which are basically backgrounds. You can see them here. You're going through like the, the hundred of them. <laughs> um, some of them aren't yet completely finished uh, because they're going to get additional modifiers. So if you take um, additional ranks of a skill, you get additional abilities. This is relatively optional. Um, there are some mechanics for like what happens when you hit zero life and how to leave the game. Um, but like I said, the core is about 20 pages for the, the mechanics itself, but it's ornate uh, because there are all these options. And the reason I decided to go for this ornate minimalist approach is twofold. Um, one, I realized that if I wanted to write a minimalist, short, simple thing, I had to have the whole big thing first. Like, like with sculpture, you have to have the whole block and then you carve out the, the, the small thing. So. I still have the dream putting out like brave sea cat at some point, 
which is going to be very short. Uh, but I need to do the big thing first. And the second thing, um, why this ornate minimalist approach is, uh, because with a lot of minimalist games, there's this thing that happens, which I actually dislike. Um, it comes to this point, it's like, you get the rules, there's like four pages of rules, and it's like, okay, and now you want to do this extra thing, just make it up. And I don't like that. Like, I, I like making stuff up. Um, I like making stuff up when it's a choice that I get to make stuff up. But having a system that assumes that I'm going to, for example, make up all the spells, like here you go, you have a system and you have like six keywords and just make up what it does, um, is, is one of those things where I find that at the table with players, uh, there are some players that really love that and jump into it and are just gonna make everything up. But for some of them, it's just going to block them completely and they're just gonna freeze up or they're not going to enjoy it. Uh, and for myself, one thing I, I find is that if somebody, if I am just given a blank canvas and told to just make things up with no constraints, no prompts, uh, I will often make up similar things because given a similar situation, my mind tends to go to similar places, right? Uh, and so uh, that's why TCAT is ornate with all these options, because the idea is you're going to get this unusual prompt and then you're going to have to figure out how to make it work for you but you can always re-roll or just choose something else just make something up that's always an option it's like you can always make something up but if you have options already you have the choice i can choose or i can make it up and so and that's why it's 250 pages now <laughs> and 50 pages in the in in the other book the one for making worlds <laughs> well, and so before we, I know we're getting long on time. Let's just cover that one off because I, I think it's a pretty amazing uh, world building piece that you put together here. Oh yeah, listen, yeah, yeah. the the monochrome rainbow, the the little uh, mini game, the world building game, yeah. yeah. Um. So so this one um started out because I'm now running uh, a group of players through the first run of, let, let's call it the sequel to UVG, which goes into the other side, it has some different structures. And uh, I had this idea, okay, I'm gonna start it out with them creating the region in detail, and then I'm gonna spring a surprise on, their, on them after it happens. And yeah, this is, there we go. There's the picture right in the middle. Um, and, and then I realized, okay, no, this is, this is its own game. I shouldn't bundle it in. And so I split it out and over the last uh, couple of weeks, uh, hammered out uh, the system and um, it's still in version 0 0.1. Uh, but the basic idea is that the, um, it's, uh, it's not, this is not a game with, uh, with a game master. Like all the players, so it crosses over between role-playing games and, and board games in some ways. And it's used to create the region that you can then play in. So each of the players uh, gets, uh, a little avatar called an Eidolon or Eidolon. Um, uh, so uh, uh, th this plays into the, the mythos of the Rainbow Land, which I haven't published. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, the background of it, but yeah, uh, uh, yeah they're, they're basically the reanimated spirits of, uh, of the dead scientists sent to create a world. Um, and uh, they, they choose some some idols, which are like uh, AI protocols that uh, that they can that help them. And um, then they roll dice to first place the terrain. And uh, and depending on the idols, each of the players uh, gets certain uh, bonuses if they place certain kinds of terrain. So um, and multiple players can end up with the same idols. Um, so in the first chapter, when you're placing terrain, different players are being driven to place different things because that'll give them a bit more points. Um, and so this way you end up with uh, a player generated province um, or the terrain of it. And then in the second chapter of the game, you are placing things like uh, cities and roads and railroads and uh, the weird, weird stuff that they're doing and outposts and farms and mines. So putting on the human geography on the place. Um, yeah, and uh, recently, actually, uh, it could be nice to show like some of the finished maps that, that come out of that, uh, because they end up varying really a lot depending on, on how players map. Yeah, this is going to be another one. So that, that big uh, three hexes in the middle, that's going to be a, 
a big city <laughs> that uh, that's there by default and then and then you place things around it well i mean you are like so prolific i you uh, are you working at it now full time as far as like uh, yeah livelihood? yeah yeah pretty much i've i've been able to make games full time since uh 2020 i think so it was really scary the pandemic starting and then ah yeah <laughs> Did, and is there any advice that you would give to like aspiring designers because i kind of reflecting upon the story yeah. that you said you you know you went to the forge and they're like you know go away and and yeah. like how often do people do you think get frustrated and just kind of give up and how much should they stick uh, with i think quite a lot I, I think quite a lot so um so one of the things that's really important is that uh, they should work on things they enjoy if you're working on something you enjoy it's going to be easy to keep doing it even though you will face frustrations like you you will get brushed off or ignored um and sometimes even by accident, like, like I get quite a lot of messages now. Um, and I just, uh, in order to preserve my time, I tend to not respond to emails before like one or two in the afternoon or, or any messages. And so sometimes though, I'll check on my phone, like there's an Instagram message. Oh, okay, nice. And then I forget because I don't respond in the morning. So, and then I just, so it's very easy to, to miss that. So if you're working on something that, um, that you enjoy it's going to be easy to keep doing it um because th this kind of work uh there's a lot of iteration and um the feedback is very difficult like i get a lot of positive feedback but just i guess just the way the human mind works when i see a negative feedback or a criticism oh that, that's like a stab <laughs> to the gut every single time um and it's the weirdest thing you know it might be like random person on reddit thinks the system i designed is dumb my brain goes like oh my god you <laughs> suck you can't do anything you're terrible um and, and this is just like re really hard like ha how to distance from that uh, and so uh, the thing is to, to make the, the actual thing sort of fun and um and this was something i also struggled with for, for a long time like how, how do i know what i enjoy doing um because i was uh let's say sort of other directed and a people pleaser. I mean, I guess I still am, um, but to, to a larger extent, right? And so I tended to try to do the things that I thought other people would want, um, specifically like, you know, friends, family, and so on. Um, and this meant that I was not doing the things I actually enjoyed. So it was sort of a learning process to find out what do I enjoy. And uh, recently, um, I, I came across a tweet that actually sort of summarized it in a, in a very good way. How do you know if you're enjoying the thing you're doing? If it's actually giving you energy as you do it, as if you feel like excited and happy to do it, you are probably enjoying it. If it feels like a chore, this is probably not something you enjoy. And, uh, and it's really crucial because if you enjoy something, it's going to be very easy to uh, or not very easy, but much easier to do the thing that that you need to do to actually get good, which is you have to hone your skills, you have to practice, you have to practice purposefully, you have to iterate. Like, and this is slow. This is so annoying. It takes so much work um, that that it's uh, like like if I knew, let's say, um, ten years ago, how much work it was going to be because I've I've been now sort of like more or less ma making games for ten years um i would probably have given up if it wasn't something that i really enjoyed because it's a lot that said uh it's it's doable and um one of the things that, that i found very useful uh ah, well okay do you have any other questions because yeah i, I don't want to take too long <laughs> no i don't go ahead i i, I don't okay, mind yeah. if you have so what yeah so one of the things i find uh, really um useful is um like, like blogs that deconstruct how systems work like uh there was one i think it's like delta's dnd &D blog or something that went really deep into maths and stuff like that like i i found that really fascinating because it was like breaking down how the, these games work or like the analysis of like the old avalon hill wilderness survival games and like why was wilderness travel like that 
it's very interesting because when you get into those uh, breakdowns, you can sort of like see, okay, these are the moving pieces. This, this is how they fit together. Um, then in terms of practice, a thing I found very useful for design practice uh, was to um, give myself very limited time. Because one, one thing I found with digital design tools, it's very easy to, do, to use control Z, undo. And there's this idea, I'm gonna make something perfect. But making a single thing perfect is the enemy of actually getting good at stuff. Because if you spend like a, a, on a drawing, if you spend eight hours getting a drawing anatomically perfect, you've learned less than if you've spent like two hours drawing like five and uh, 10 minute sketches and then like a, th a 30 minute study and then more sketches because you want to make the mistakes. And with a control Z, you can undo the mistakes so you don't see it. But if you work in a physical medium or without control Z, if you have the self-discipline, which I don't, <laughs> um, you, will, you will see a stack of paper like this. This is all drawings um, with all your mistakes. And this is where you then see how to fix them because then you start to pinpoint, okay, I keep doing this thing wrong. And then you can start actually looking online. How do I fix this? Like, um, like, oh, I don't know. I always get my elbows wrong. Why do I get my elbows wrong if I'm drawing humans? Uh, or, or I always get perspective wrong. When I make it, uh, it always looks weird. And then you can like, focus on that thing because each of these is a different skill. Um, and specifically with design, uh, it's very easy to get bogged down in this thing where like you're working on a book and it's a big thing, that's 30 pages. That's a lot of design work. And if you're learning how to do design, you're going to spend a lot of time on it. And it might end up looking good, but if you've taken a really long time to do it, you have not learned as much as you would if you were, for example, giving yourself a task to every day do like a 30 minute design project. Like literally take a timer, put it on. You've got like 30 minutes, um, limited scope. This is like uh, the message you want to convey and off you go. Take, uh, take one visual, take some text, take a body text, put it together and then just do that. Like, uh, because it's that repetition, because a lot of them will just be bad, but, it's, but that is really good. Like, like a messed up bad design is really great for learning because you can easily see what's wrong. If you've spent like four or six hours massaging a design, like say a book cover, and it's like, yeah, that looks kind of good now. Yeah, but oh, no, no, because you haven't learned. You've just been like nudging it around, pushing it around, and, um, and it's much, much better to just like make those 30 minute works with the mistakes, warts and all, and then uh, just be able to look at all of them. Like even if you set up like an Instagram for yourself and just doing it like, so, so that you can like see the wall of them and then look at the mistakes you've made. Mistakes are awesome. Well, I think that's really good advice to end on. And uh, I just want to, you know, thank you for sharing a bit of your wisdom and your work and your process and uh, your, your products. I have no are... wisdom, only, only mistakes <laughs> that I have survived. <laughs> that's a good way to put it. But, uh, you know, thanks for joining me today. I uh, really appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing what you're uh, going to work on in the future. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Pleasure. <laughs> thank you. Take care. Bye.